My guess is everybody in the room or a lot of you have something like this. If you got one, pull it out. Let's make a little noise. You got some of these with you this morning? These are important, okay? And uh, we take them for granted. We take them for granted. They can get us into our cars. You can still jingle if you still get them out. It's fine. It doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, I can get into my house. I can get into the building here. I got some other things. You probably have some, some devices on this little ring that you don't know what they're for. I have no idea, but I don't want to throw them away because what, what if we need them? <laughs> this is the magic key that we've been looking for all this time. Uh, here's the thing. We, we love our keys, and they're valuable, but they're probably one of the things in our life that we take, the, take for granted the most. Uh, we don't think about our keys. Just put them in your pocket, go. Put them in your pocketbook, go. There's a spot in your house you put them when you get home, a hook you hang them on, go. Until you have that early morning meeting that you've got to be at, and you overslept your alarm just a little bit, and you're just in time to make it, and you're like, shoot, where are my keys? I can't find them. Or, question, anybody ever locked their keys in the car? Yeah, it's, it's the worst. Uh, nothing can make you feel quite as inadequate as a human being. <laughs> How hard is it? How hard is it? Before I lock the door, <laughs> should I look and see if I have my keys with me? And those of you who are all too good and you haven't done it yet, give it time. You will lock your keys in the car eventually. I can think of so many moments where I lock my keys in the car. But one of my favorite moments in this moment of locking your keys in the car is how quickly everyone in your life will jump to action to save you. Oh, we got this. Don't you worry, buddy. And there's always some guy who's like, man, I can break into a car in 35 seconds. Yeah. Now, what you don't realize is that was in the 80s when they used to could do that. And so that person's got the coat hanger, and they're using the shoelace, and they got a door you know, wedge, and they're hammering in there, and like, we should just call the fire department. You know, it's like, no, I got this. And then they're like sweating. 35 minutes later, I'm calling AAA. I'm like, yeah, Chris House thinks he can get into this car. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, sorry, Chris, I think you're in the lobby. Um, you've always got a friend. You've always got a friend who thinks they can do it. And the, the thing is, man, it's so hard because you're looking at your keys. They're right there. They're through this much glass. And it's so tempting just to throw a brick through it. And then you realize, that's just the worst way to solve this problem. You have proximity to your car, but zero access. And that's the feeling I want us to lean into this morning as we get into this morning's teaching. Because we've been going through this teaching series through the book of Acts called When God Sparks a Movement. And we're going through the whole book. The idea is to get through the whole book in just eight weeks. And if you've been following along, you know that every week we've given you like a key word to study along with. So if you memorize all the words, you can kind of have the book of Acts memorized in order. We're not going to do the full review this week because there's a lot. And next week is the last week of all the words. And so I want to do a big review next week. But I will just say the words with you. And if you know them, you can think them or say them out loud. But the words were weight. They were helper boldness, persecution, transformation, and last week we got into inclusion. Whew, I was afraid I wouldn't be able to remember them all. This is a story of how God takes the moment of his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, and this few group of Jewish disciples, and a spark phew, happens. But that spark gets quickly fanned by the Holy Spirit into flame. And it spreads, and it spreads, and it spreads. And over just the first few chapters of the book of Acts, you have thousands of people calling Jesus Lord. And then uh, last week, we met a group of people that were not even Jewish as the inclusion of the Gentiles begins to happen. And it begins to spread and spread and spread. And this week, we're going to take a look at a guy named Paul. A Paul. Paul's the guy that Perry preached about a couple weeks ago, and he had a huge transformation in his life. He becomes the greatest Christian missionary to ever live, and how Paul takes the message of Jesus beyond just the sphere of Jewish influence, but into the greater Roman Empire world. And he helps people far from God have access to him. Today's word is accessible. Accessible. The reality is God is totally accessible. He's very much there. And everyone is in close proximity to him. But many people feel like they've lost their keys. They don't know where to find them. They lock them in the car. They're right there. God is near. But what does it mean for me to have access to his presence in my life and his power in the things in my life? And so we got the Apostle Paul. And we're going to do like, like there's so much. As you've studied this, you, you notice like the first message was only like half a chapter. The second message, we get through chapter 2. The third message, we're all the way through chapter 4. By the time we get here, we're doing chunks and chunks and chunks of the book of Acts because you start to see this like snowball effect begin to happen. And as Paul is traveling around the Mediterranean world, he is going all over the place, dozens and dozens of cities, thousands and thousands of people, and he's telling his favorite story. Jesus rose from the dead. God put skin on. He came into the world. He lived a sinless life, and he's got a path back to you, back to God 
for you. Let me teach you about this. But as he goes to these different reason, regions, like he's going to find people who are farther and farther and farther from the idea even of God as the Jews understood him. How do you begin to talk about the truth of God to a group of people who are like, it's so foreign to them. It's alien. The concepts of Christianity, the concepts of monotheism even. How do you even get that into people's head? And so there, there's a, probably a lot of things. He could obviously teach a master class on what it means to tell people about Jesus. But there's a principle that I want us to embrace today, and I hope it's something you can take home with you, literally put it into action this week, uh, and this is it. This is what Paul teaches us, I think, if you, you can kind of glean it from all of his actions, that Paul would learn to meet people where they are to make God's love accessible to them. Meet people where they are. Like whatever it is that's happening in their life, you go there, to that place in their life. Their brokenness, uh, their, their, their busyness, their family, whatever it is. You go into their life, and in that context, you find them there, and you show them God's love, and you make it accessible to them. Paul was the master of making God's message accessible to people. And it's unbelievable the things he did to make it happen to so many different people groups. I don't know how familiar you are with Paul's life and journeys. It's fascinating. Uh, I, I want to put a map up on the screen. We'll just leave it up there for a minute. This is a map that if you have one of those kind of illustrated Bibles, you can look at the back and there's a bunch of maps. These are Paul's missionary journeys. Paul took four major missionary journeys, three kind of loop journeys and one that just ended in Rome. So four big journeys, and you can see them color-coded there. Just kind of look through that as I talk about it. During the course of his life, after he became a Christian, after the moments that, you know, uh, Perry talked about a few weeks ago, he began traveling and telling people about Jesus, and he traveled over 7,000 miles. I don't think we have a full concept of that. That would be like walking across continental United States three and a half times on foot. That's a lot, a lot of travel. But remember, no cars, no planes, no trains. He took a boat one time at least. He might have ridden on the back of a donkey or something every now and then. But this is hard and strenuous labor. And it wasn't just a leisure stroll. This is a guy who's all along the way teaching and preaching and writing and establishing new churches and also being chased and battled by opposition and at the threat of his own life very often at the near, uh, near death because of someone trying to threaten him. And so like, let's just keep looking at this. And I want to try to put this in context in some kind of modern way. And so I want to compare the life I've had in the last 20 years to what Paul went through in his ministry life. And maybe you can overlay your own personal life experience in the same way. Okay, so let me just kind of tell you my life history. For, since uh, 2002, I've been in vocational ministry, so almost 22 years. I've been uh, in some way making a career out of talking about Jesus and going from place to place. It started when I was in Norfolk, Virginia. I was just coming right. I was finishing up college, still a college student, driving up to Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we were part of a very old and established church, and, uh, man, I went in to be their worship leader and to be their youth minister. And so we were there for about five years. Uh, it was a very difficult season for that church. Many of you have heard that story. It was a difficult season for my own life. It was a trial by fire in many ways. We were there for five years. We built a lot of really good relationships and got really close to a lot of families, and we were there for five years. Now, I was uh, five years into that, we decided to move to Greenville, North Carolina. We go south a little bit. We moved to Greenville, North Carolina. We be part of another church. I'm just a youth minister there, now just over middle school and high school students. And in that time, it was a whole different dynamic of church going on there. And I was able to build different relationships and be involved in different ways. And I was able to grow in leadership. And it was there that I really started to work on a skill as a teacher and a preacher and doing those kind of things. And, and we were there for five years, and it was great. And we were building a relationship there at an established church. And then I started to feel this call to be involved in church planting. And so uh, then about 13 years ago, we moved moved to Kannapolis, North Carolina, just northeast of Charlotte, and my family goes there to do, I, I was doing an apprenticeship with a, a church plant there, and I worked with a church there and learned a lot and grew a lot, and we went through a lot of challenges there, and we made some great relationships, and we built some family there, and then from there, we travel across the state to Wilmington, and this is uh, close to 12 years ago when my family moved to Wilmington to start Venture Church, and so this was maybe the closest thing to what Paul experienced in his life. As we show here, we had no friends here. We were what in church planting world you call a, a parachute drop. Uh, we just kind of fell into the city, and we began to build relationships. And you know, we're just going to parks, literally cold meeting parents at the park and just trying to build friendships and you know my kids are playing sports and I start doing Cub Scouts with my son and we're meeting some people and we're meeting our neighbors and we're doing all this stuff and slowly but surely we start like a Bible study and then it becomes a house church and the house church grows and then m many of you have been around for a lot of the rest of that journey as we launched church a little more than 10 years ago at the YMCA and fast forward to today. Okay that's the last 22 years of my life. I'm going to tell you it has been easily 
need such a rewarding life. And the last especially 10, 11 years, 13 years, has been easily the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, okay? But I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. That's in 2024. Let's tell that story again, but let's do it through the, through the lens of you're in the first century and you're the Apostle Paul, okay? But we'll use some of the same terms and places. And so I leave my house at 19 years old in Wilson, North Carolina. I start walking to Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> I hope I-95 is built by now. <laughs> and I'm just walking. And along the way, people are trying to beat me with sticks and cuss me out and throw me in bushes. But I try, and I have every now and then I run along some friendly people who take me in, and I tell them about Jesus. And, but I finally make it to Norfolk. We want to go to this like urban and, and, and metropolis area, and we get there. And when I get there, I have to start making some friends out the gate. And so I got to convince them that I'm not crazy and that God has spoken to me <laughs> and that I do have some truth for them and help them through their worldview issues. And while we're there, we haven't even started like what we would call a church yet. We're just like talking to them about faith. And eventually some people come along, come around. And then one by one, we start to identify some leaders and like, okay, some leaders in the church. And I don't know how long it takes, but I'm finally after years and years and years, I find some people like, okay, you guys can lead this church. Okay, you guys are the elders of this local church. I'm going to start walking south. So we leave Norfolk, and we start walking to Greenville, North Carolina. Now, along the way, I've got a mission. So I'm talk, stopping in every little hamlet and village and town along the way, talking about Jesus, getting thrown in bushes, rocks thrown at me, beat up severely. And, oh, i got to walk back to Norfolk and talk to them about a few things because they had questions. And I write them some letters, and I mail the letters back, and then I walk back again, and I get some more letters because there's this guy on a horse that's bringing me letters. And so I'm writing letters, and I'm sending them back. Finally, I make it to Greenville, and guess what? I start all over again, and I start making friends, and maybe some people there already kind of follow Jesus because the word's been spreading. So there's a group of probably 20 or 30 people already there, and that's good. And so we start to gather, and we start to meet, but I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm Paul. And so I'm sitting there like trying to teach them things, and I'm writing letters back to Norfolk and to all these little villages along the way, and they've got questions, and an uprising begins, and on and on it goes. But I'm there for 5, 6, 10, 15 more years. And finally, a group is established, and we've got a couple of house churches going, and I've established some local eldership, and I said, okay, Whew, you know what needs Jesus? Charlotte, North Carolina. So I start walking, and I'm all the way to Charlotte. By the time I get there, these letters are coming from Norfolk and from Greenville and all the cities along the way, and I'm trying to build leaders. You, you feel this exhaustion and how hard it is? And then I decide to So I begin to walk from Charlotte to, to Wilmington now. And I'm going to get on a boat this time because Paul did. There's not really a reason to get on a boat between Charlotte and Wilmington. And along the way, the boat crashes in a very bad storm. And I'm just, just stranded on this island. And while there, I get bit by a poisonous snake and almost die. That totally happened to Paul. And then I finally make it to Wilmington. And guess what? I'm going to start all over again. Do you have a picture now of what the life of Paul was like? As he begins traveling and establishing new churches all over the Mediterranean region. But thanks to Paul and his companions, what's amazing is that today, this morning, in Wilmington, North Carolina, in this building on Darlington Avenue, there's a church family meeting. When God sparks a movement, it begins to spread all over the world. And we're not the only Christians here in Wilmington. I mean hundreds and thousands of believers just in our city alone are giving glory to God and giving their lives to Jesus because of the efforts of these early, early missionaries. It's incredible. And so when you talk about accessible and what it means to go to people where they are, you're going to meet people in different contexts with different backgrounds and different baggages and different things, different problems. What does it mean to show them not only that God is near, but I can give you the keys to access what he can do in your life. So the way I want to illustrate that this morning is just to look at one story. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and flip over to Acts chapter 17. That's where we'll be. And we're going to find the Apostle Paul in the city of Athens. Athens is still a major city today. I probably couldn't overstate how important the city of Athens is to world history. Athens is the, the birthplace of philosophy. I mean, you get great names from Athens like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, and they started schools. And the way that we think to this day, like there is like a delineation in worldview around the world that we call Eastern thinking and Western thinking. Uh, you think being in, you know, America, that we're the West. No, no, no. The, the, the West begins in Athens. That's where Western thinking literally is born. 
They train up great leaders like Alexander the Great, who goes from there and builds empire, and the Roman Empire and other empires are built off of that. But you know some of the things we do in culture and society and politics and, and economy and today is based on things that were established back when Alexander the Great was doing things. So, so much happens in the city of Athens. And you find Paul and his traveling companions coming through Athens. And at, like always, they have pretty much one goal. They want to preach about their most favorite subject. They want to talk about Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. God came to earth. He wants to tell you all about it, and he can give you a path back to God through his love. And he wants to show them God is near. But listen, this ain't, this ain't Jerusalem anymore. I mean, you're a long way from the influence of people who could give a, a, a care about who Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are. They may never even heard these names. They don't care about King David. He doesn't impress them. By the time you're in Athens, you've got a whole different worldview and, and, and religious system, how do you get into people's lives who are so far from your worldview that you can help them understand who God is? So he lands in Athens, and he starts out like he always does, speaking to some Jewish people. So if you're in Acts chapter 17, just the first few verses there, you'll see that he goes into some synagogues, and he speaks with some Jewish pe- people like he always does, because that's the smart thing to do. You start where, you know, the cards are stacked in your favor, and you can begin getting some traction. He starts talking to the Jews, but as he's walking through the city, he sees that the city is just full of all these idols. And idolatry is a really big thing in Judaism. It's God's not for it. He's a jealous God. He's, I'm, I'm the only God. Don't worship things that you made with your hands. Worship the creator who made you with his hands. And so Paul sees all this and he says, man, okay, I'm going to have to talk about this. So we pick it up at, uh, this is verse 18. Verse 18. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Okay, just pause there. You can leave that on the screen. Paul has made his way to the marketplace. This is a, in, in Athens and a lot of these cultures, it's, it's popular to go to a, uh, a forum where you can just publicly discuss things, you know, and, and keep things going. And so um, the, uh, the people he talks to are the Stoics and the Epicureans. The big worldview things, if you've uh, studied this in high school, you might remember the Stoics and the Epicureans. But here's a shortcut on what they basically believe. Uh, the Stoics, maybe you've heard of someone being Stoic. A Stoic is a person that believes that the path to true happiness is in self-denial. So the idea is that they say less is more. They're not materialistic. They want to simplify things. Everything is about stripping back to the bare minimum. There were some things, though, about Christianity that the Stoics thought were pretty good. It appealed to them. Mainly the emphasis that happiness cannot be found in material things. That's something that the Stoics enjoyed. So as Paul's talking, I guess they're leaning in. They're like, we kind of like that. Now, the Epicureans, they were the complete polar opposite of the Stoics. The Epicureans, they didn't deny themselves anything. You might have heard one of the you know, slogans of the Epicureans, which is, we should eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we, what? For tomorrow we die. Live it up. Do it right. Have fun. They believe that all happiness came from physical pleasure. So rather than denying myself, it's like, why would I deny myself? The purpose that I'm here is to experience and to enjoy. But there were some things about Christianity that the Epicureans appreciated. The concepts of things like joy and love and the whole worldview about spiritual things. And there was a lot of things that appealed to them. And so as Paul's speaking to both the Stoics and the Epicureans, these guys, as different as they were, they decide they want to hear more. They'll pick it up there, the second half of that verse. It says that some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating for foreign gods. I love that line. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, I'm not sure exactly what Paul said in this teaching. I don't know exactly what his words were. But it piqued their interest. And so they wanted to get deeper. So verse 19 says, They took him and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So, quick pause here, okay? There are pieces of what Paul was trying to say that are catching the attentions of all the spectrum, the whole gamut, the Stoics and the Epicureans. They want to hear more, so they do something very important. They invite him to an area called the Areopagus. I've got a picture of it as it looks today. And so look, take a look at this picture. And so you, this kind of like 
precipice, mountain, rock, hill here. Uh, it's, it's really high in Athens. You can kind of see it from wherever you are. And it was the tradition and the habit of leaders who want to talk about important things to go up there and discuss them like good philosophers do. And it was a great honor to be invited to speak to the Areopagus. The things that Paul was saying apparently were appealing enough that they were like, we want to know more. So they invite him up there and he begins to talk. Now, if you had a chance to talk to a big group of influential non-Christians, one chance, what would you say? Because this is the scenario that Paul is faced with. He gets this perhaps once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to speak into the lives of some influential people of a totally different worldview. What would you say? I think modern church people could learn a lot from what Paul does here at the Areopagus. I've had people show up at my door, knock on my door, and I understand as soon as they begin talking that they're here to talk to me about their faith, about their religion. Some Christian, some other faiths. And I'm going to tell you what, they blow it in the first five seconds. They, they immediately are judgmental or mean or say something that's like, dang, if you want me to, you want me to listen to you, why would you start like that? I one time was in Walmart and I was walking around and for like three or four aisles I just felt this presence kind of creepy guy kind of sort of following me around. I'm like, I, I see you. And eventually, like he walks up and he was like, excuse me, do you know Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? And he gives me this like pamphlet, right? Have you ever got the pamphlet? Like this tract. And then he begins to tell me how I'm going to burn an eternal fire. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice of him? That's what he wanted to tell me at Walmart. I'm like, bro, you don't even know me. Like, <laughs> but that's how they started. I remember being one time on, uh, on the ferry, the Staten Island ferry, riding in to New York City. I'm really there with my brother to see the Statue of Liberty. You go watch a concert. Like, that's what I'm there for. But there's this guy on a box, and he's preaching hellfire and damnation. He's telling all of us all of our worst sins as if he knows our inner thoughts and our minds, looks right at me and my brother and says some terrible things to us. I'm just like, okay. Wow, interesting. So when he got done, I went and sat next to him on the bench because I'm that guy. I'm like, bro, so tell me, tell me about what, what's going on here. What are you doing? And he begins to tell me his thoughts. I'm like, cool. I did, look, man, I, I'm a believer too. I'm actually a Christian. I'm just curious. Do you ever, uh, you ever get much fruit out of this thing you do? Like it doesn't seem. And then he told me that I was probably not a brother of his. I mean, that's not your first line, Okay. And so if you had one chance to speak to someone who doesn't have the same faith that you, it's important to think about what that moment might be like and to learn from Paul with what he's about to do here. I love how he handles it. Handles it In verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, Remember, he saw all the statues, the idols, all over the place. I even found an idol with this inscription, to an unknown God. So there's a little plaque on one of them that said that, to an unknown God. So you're, in, you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. He doesn't use ignorant in like a, a, a derogative way. Just saying, like, you, you, don't even know, you don't even know the thing you worship. You've got a sign that says to the unknown God. You clearly care about it. But there's more, and you asked me to come talk about what I know. And that's what I'm going to proclaim to you. Paul, of all the apostles, I, th I would think it would be very fair to say, is the most educated in anything. He was the smartest. He had gotten farthest in, in, in Jewish religious teaching. He had become a teacher in his own right. He was, you know, accredited by the Sanhedrin to do their bidding. If anybody knows Old Testament law and what God believes about, says about idolatry, and all, it's Paul. If anybody could get up and preach on this and bring down hellfire and damnation, it's Paul. But that's not how he starts. I don't know everything there is to know about Greek theology. I won't even begin to, to try. But there's enough in, uh, information right here to say they were open to the concept of the divine. They were. They worshiped things all the time. They had a, a, a complicated relationship with it. A lot of it was just political and social, and, and, and a lot of it was superstition. And so they had all these idols, but the thing is, they were like, we're in for whoever. And, and actually, we're scared to make anybody mad. We don't make any deity mad. And so we actually have got this extra idol, just in case we missed anybody. <laughs> this is to the unknown God. This is like, we want to cover it all. And it's a brilliant move that Paul makes here. He's like, you know what? It's interesting. I see this in your city. Can we talk about that? You've got this idol to an unknown God. And it's 
as sure as they were about their intellect, they, they still felt some tie to faith and religion. And so he speaks to that. And so this is a genius idea. He's like, let me, let me use something I see in your own life, in your own culture. Let me use that as a key to open the doorway into a conversation about God, about Jesus. Let me tell you about the God that you don't know. I happen to know a great deal about him. So we pick up his teaching in verse 24. He says, you know, the God who made the world and everything in it, that right there is a worldview shaker. (laughs) Wait, there's one God that made the world and everything in it? He is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. Very key to Jewish culture, I mean Greek culture. There's all these temples all over the place, and this is the hot spot where that God lives. This is the hot spot where this God lives. This is the hot spot where this God lives. No, God, this God doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. You think your gods are mad because you didn't give them enough grain this year? Because you didn't dedicate enough babies to them this year? You think, he doesn't need that. He's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, he gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, in fact, he made all nations. He's talking about the creation story. That they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us. So Paul begins to preach, but he's not preachy. He's just like, I just want to talk about something that seems to be important to you guys. And he doesn't call them stupid, and he doesn't try to scare them, and he doesn't try to alienate them. He just talks to them right where they are. He meets them where they are in a conversation they were already having. And what's awesome is what we read in verse 27. We we just saw it, but I'll look at it again. He says, God did all this so that we, they, us, would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. Though he's not far from any of us. And so the message there is like, listen, God is near. He is near. He's closer than you could imagine. In fact, he's right here. But Paul knows it's not good enough to have proximity to the car. you got to have access. you got to be let in. You can't be locked out by your circumstances or your sins or maybe your ignorance or your lack of knowledge or whatever it is that goes into that. So he hands these people a key to unlock a door. He shows them that God is near, but he's also accessible. That's really the lesson today. Like, what does it mean for us to get into people's life and show them through what they're already talking about, through what they're already doing, through the struggles they may have, or even the the triumphs that they're, you know, celebrating? Man, God's in that too. Let me show you. Verse 28, he does another brilliant thing. He says this, For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. We are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. He's again speaking to these idols. You know, you, you, know you made these, right? You know you, you, made, you know you made this out of gold and silver and stone and wood. And you, you know you carved this, right? You made this. Why are you worshiping this thing you made? This doesn't make any sense. It's interesting because he uses their own poet. He quotes this poet. That's another way he's getting on their level. And he doesn't, like, shriek away from talking about their problems. Like, this is a problem. Can't you see the logical problem with worshiping these idols? And there's a great lesson in this. You know, there's not anything about watering down the truth of God or skipping over it or, you know, avoiding it. You can say it. But you got to do it where people are and in the context of what they understand and what they can do. And he continues doing this in verse 30. He says, in the past, you know, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. What has Paul just crossed over into? His favorite subject. He's talking about Jesus. And, of course, they're going to ask questions. We don't have the whole, you know, transcript of everything. What do you mean, this man who raised from the dead? Yeah, I mean, I was talking about him down on the market. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. What do you think about that? And there's a discourse. And there's moments where they're probably like, that sounds crazy. He's like, I know, right? I know. But I saw him with my own eyes, and I got a whole lot of friends who saw him. And so, like, just hear me out. It's about meeting people where they are and helping point them towards Jesus. 
We don't ever have to skip truth. We don't ever have to water down the message of God. We can be as straightforward as we need to be, but we have to be cognizant of who we're talking to, the context that we're in, and how much they can understand. Also, not to disrespect them, treat them like they're like they're idiots. I think that most people are open to spiritual conversation. You, you just have to be willing to get to the right door, take the key, unlock it, and let them in. Paul does this all over the place. One of the greatest teachings about this is something he says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. It'll be on the screen, but you can look at it again in your Bible if you want to. 1 Corinthians 9 is where it is. He says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like the Jew to win the Jews. And to those who were under the law, I became one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those who are under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. This sounds confusing. Paul likes to talk like this, but stick with me. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak to win the weak. And I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. And I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul understands that he cannot shove four, five, six thousand years of Jewish history down these throats of these Athenian people in their home court in this one lesson. He understands that. So he says, to the Jew I become like a Jew, to the Gentile I become like a Gentile, to the weak I become weak. I do whatever it takes. Does this mean he compromises who he is and his integrity and his morality? No, you'll see that in all of Paul's stuff. He's never like, well, okay, if we're all going to the strip club, I guess I'll just go to the strip club because that's where I'm going to meet people for Jesus. No, 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 no. That's not what Paul's doing at all. But it's like I'm also not going to pretend that I'm all high and mighty and standing on this mighty throne and I can come down and dictate judgment on you because I've got it figured out. No, I'm going to come into your context. I'm going to understand who you are, and I'm going to speak to you in a word that you can understand. So I can make God's truth accessible to you. And so check this out. After all this teaching, it says that two people accepted the message. Two people. I've met a lot of leaders in my life, and they tend to be competitive. And I just wonder if sometimes Peter and Paul got together later. Peter's like, well, you know, the first sermon I preached in Jerusalem, uh, 3,000 people (laughs) decided. uh, A couple weeks later, it was actually 5,000. We were growing pretty quick. Uh, But two's good. Two's good, Paul. Two's good. That's good. Uh, I doubt they went at it like that. Here's the thing, man. The, the, the pump was primed in Jerusalem. I mean, this is a people group who understood the God of Abraham. They understood the morality portion. They understood the expectations of God. Th- there are sometimes we're going to encounter people who are just ready. The soil is fertile. The seeds have been planted. The plant is grown, and all we get to do is just bloop, <laughs> pick the apples, right? Hey, cool. But then sometimes we go into some very, very difficult land where it takes a lot of tilling and digging up rocks and pulling up weeds and taking time and some of you have family members and neighbors and friends that might be like this and sometimes too is great we started this church with the mission of being church for people who don't like church and if you've been here for 10 years you know that it's been a slow growth and you know what that's by by design we said listen we, we want to be accessible And so that means that someone who's been in church their whole life might come in here and be bored. (laughs) They might be like, yeah, okay, all right, well, I'm going to go down the street. And that's fine. All our brothers and sisters in Wilmington, I love them all. I will never talk trash about any other church in this city. And I think a lot of them have the same vision that we do. I would say say all of us want to reach lost people. That's for sure. But when I look at Paul's story in Athens and I see two, I know this. Two is good. Because today in Athens, right now, there are still Christians. The church in Athens is still there. I would love to know the spiritual family tree of those two people. Like, what did they do? Who else had to come along behind Paul and continue to encourage them? Who did Paul leave behind? How long did he stay there? We don't have a lot of these details. But what I do know is that two is good. Every week I try to give us a challenge we can take home and I think a lot of us get frustrated with some people in our lives. We're like, man, I just wish they could see what I see. I wish they could just understand what I understand. I wish they could step into this relationship with God that I have. And it's hard for us to be patient with them. And it's hard for us to take the time to do the things that need to be done. And especially some of you are like, you should know better. Like, we've already talked about this. Now, some of that is stubbornness and some of it is sinfulness. A lot of it sometimes is. 
But what's the challenge for this week? I, I, don't, I don't know what the best challenge for you is, but I've, I've got something I want to put before you and see if you can do that. This is something I think you could do in the next five, six days. This week, identify one door that you can unlock for someone so they can understand the nearness of God. One door. That's, that's pretty abstract, so let me put some, some skin on it. A lot of parents in this room. Okay, so I'm talking about your children. The, the people we are responsible for first are our children and our spouses. That's, that's the beginnings of it. Maybe for you as a parent, it's deciding that you're finally going to do it. You're, you're finally going to pray together out loud as a family. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. And guess what? Guess who's going to go first? You are. You're going to say, hey, guys, before we go to bed tonight, let's just gather together in the living room and pray real quick. And your kids are going to be like, uh, okay. Honestly, a lot of your kids might be like, oh, cool, sweet. I kind of heard about this. I'd like to try it. And you'll do it. I'll give you a trick. My family, we do it every single night, and it's not always super spiritual. Uh, it's not. <laughs> Sometimes like, we're going to pray, okay? Everybody pray. But you know how we get it started? I'm, I'm not joking. There's no, no joke at all. That has happened so many times. But it's like, this is the discipline we do. And, and, and this is the way we get it started. Simple, 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 simple. You want another cigarette? We say this. Whose turn is it to pray? <laughs> Someone says that. That's also cue, like, either mom or dad has had enough for the day, and we're, we're ready to go to bed. <laughs> Whose turn is it to pray? And we, we rotate. Everybody gets a chance to pray, and um, yeah, it's like, no, we just, we do this. We're a Christian family. This is what we do. That's, that's an idea. That, do you realize that's just a key to unlock a door? God is near. He's like right here, right now with us in our living room. Like you could talk to him right now. You see how simple that is? You know you could do the same thing for someone at, at work or, or your neighbor, just offer to pray for them. Or here's another thing. Maybe for you, it is your neighbor. And, and, and I'm encouraging, encouraging you this week to look for a moment where you could take the conversations you've already been having about your grass or those trees or that dog that keeps on pooping in somebody's yard, like whatever it is, and just just use it as an opportunity to say, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, I was going to do this uh, actually uh, this weekend, but I couldn't get to it on Saturday. And then, of course, Sunday I had to be at church, so I didn't, I didn't uh, do it Sunday. Um, boom. Okay, I've mentioned that I go to church. <laughs> they know. They, they, all, they see that you're not there. What, I can't give you every conversation, but where would that lead for you? Or something's coming up and they tell you about a death in their family. Man, that's rough. We're going to be praying for you. You mind if I pray for you right now? You see how quick that happens? Who's going to say no to that? I mean, some people. But most people are like, oh, I appreciate that. You got the keys in your pocket, but will you pull them out and just show them, like, can I just, can I just open a door for you? I want to show you. It might be for your coworker who goes on their rants about the government all the time and just to ask them a genuine question that would lead to a spiritually enriching conversation. I mean, how, do you, how do you deal with all the stress, man? Do, how does it affect your faith? Oh, you said the F word. And I don't know. They might slam that door in your faith, face. But the opportunity to open a door. So that's the challenge. What, what is a door that you could unlock for someone to help them understand the, the nearness of God that they have ex- access? Who do you need to make the truth of Jesus accessible to? We stand on the shoulders of giants. So many great men and women who have come before us and and just pioneered paths. Guys, we live in the Bible Belt South, okay? Yes, it makes it hard because some people are just so inundated with, you know, baggage about religion and faith. But, man, so much of the pump has been primed. What does it look like for you to help someone open a door, help them on their journey, help people know that God is near, he is accessible. Let's pray.